Hi and welcome back to the program analysis course. This is part four of the lecture on uh, data flow analysis. And what we'll do in this fourth part is to look at how to solve data flow equations. So in the previous videos, you have seen how you can express different static analysis problems in terms of data flow equations. And then I always uh, skipped the part where it was really about how to solve these equations and that just showed you the solutions. And now here in this video, we're going to look at how to actually efficiently solve these equations. Let's start by reminding you what these data flow equations actually are. So what we had seen previously is that in order to use a data flow analysis, you have to define these transfer functions that tell you how executing a particular statement changes the state of the analysis. And using these transfer functions yields data flow equations for each statement that tell you what the state of the analysis is at the entry of the statement and at the exit of the statement. So for example, um, we have seen equations like this where we say, oh, the state at the entry of statement number two is something and the state at the exit of statement, for example, number three um, is also something else. And now if you remember the concrete equations that we've seen, then you've probably also figured out that they sometimes depend on each other. So sometimes you have these cyclic dependencies where it's not clear how to actually compute these um, equations. So now how to solve them? Well, the goal of solving them is that eventually um, we are reaching a fixed point, which means that nothing changes anymore. So basically we've um, put one equation into another long enough so that um, nothing changes anymore. And this point is called a fixed point. And once we've reached it, we have solved these equations. Let's now have a look um, into how to reach this fixed point using an algorithm that computes um, the sets that will eventually solve our data flow equations. So we'll start by looking at a naive algorithm, which is effective. So it is correct and does exactly what we want, but it's not very efficient. And then in the next slide, we'll look at a more efficient algorithm. So this naive algorithm is a simple round robin iterative algorithm. So it's basically updating all the statements until nothing changes anymore. It starts by initializing the state, the set, um, associated with every statement by um, looking at the boundary condition and the initialization specified in the data flow problem and then applies this to every statement. So for example, every statement may start with the empty set. Then um, it has this main loop here, which continues uh, until none of the sets is changing anymore. And in each iteration, the algorithm will go through all of the statements and then do two things. It starts by updating the entry set of a statement S by first applying the meet operator to all the exit sets of the incoming statements. And then it uses the um, data flow equation that describes the exit state of that statement S by computing the new exit state, the new set um, at the exit based on the updated entry set. And this continues for all statements until nothing changes anymore. Note that this algorithm um, assumes that we have a forward analysis. This is why we first update the entry set and then compute the exit set. But you could basically do the same thing um, for a backward analysis where you would first update the exit sets and then propagate things backward by computing the new entry set. Now, the big problem with this kind of algorithm is that it repeatedly computes each of these sets, even if nothing has changed and even if none of the inputs that um, are used for the computation of these sets have changed. And this is um, not very efficient because that essentially means that you'll repeatedly compute the same um, result over and over again, even though you could actually know that it hasn't changed. A more efficient algorithm to solve these data flow equations is a so-called worklist algorithm. So essentially what the worklist algorithm does is to maintain a data structure called the worklist that represents all the statements that still need to be processed. And statements may appear in this work list repeatedly if you need to recompute the state of these statements again, because something has changed in the um, incoming statements. So let's look into this algorithm step by step. So we start similar to the other algorithm by initializing the um, uh, entry and exit sets of all the statements. So that's just the same as in the naive algorithm. And then we initialize our work list by putting um, all the initial nodes for a forward analysis or the, the final node for a backward analysis into this set. So we basically start 
um, by looking at this statement where the analysis is really supposed to start depending on whether it's a forward or backward analysis. And then the main loop of the algorithm is what you see down here. So um, it continues to run while there is some work to be done, which means while the work list is uh, not yet empty. And whenever this is the case, it starts by removing one of the statements from the work list. This can be done in an arbitrary way. There may be heuristics to actually decide which node to remove first, but um, you can remove any statement from this work list. And then once we have chosen this um, statement S, um, the next two steps are similar what, to what we've also done in the naive algorithm. It, and this is to update the entry set of the statement S by applying the meet operator to the exit sets of the incoming statements, and then com to compute the exit set of this statement S based on the now updated entry sets. So that's basically propagating um, the information through this statement S. And of course, if you have a backward analysis, um, this would be um, analogous again by um, swapping entry and exit set. And then um, the important part of this work list algorithm comes here. So now we only um, put statements back into our work list if the exit set has been changed. Um, so if nothing changes, we do not have to re revisit this statement and we do not have to um, revisit the statements that depend on that statement. Um, and therefore what the algorithm does is to check if the exit set of S has changed. And if this is the case, then and only then um, it's going to add the successors of statement S to the work list so that we then look at the statements that follow afterwards. And in addition to um, um, uh, doing this when the exit set has changed, this is also done when a statement is visited for the first time, which is just to make sure that the work list algorithm is going to visit every statement at least once. Let's illustrate this idea with a concrete example. And this concrete example is one that you have already seen in the very first video of this lecture. And that was the example for the available expression analysis. So what you see here again is the control flow graph of the piece of code that we had analyzed, where we start um, the code by having these two assignments to X and Y. Then we have this loop, which either goes into the loop body where A and X are updated or goes immediately to the exit node. Now let's do the available expression analysis on this example and let's see um, how the work list algorithm will actually do that. The very first step is to go through each of the statements and initialize the entry and exit set. And for the available expressions analysis, that means that we'll initialize all of these sets to the empty set. So I'm writing the entry set and the exit set at the top right and uh, bottom right corners of these statements here. And then once we've done this, the next step is to initialize the work list by putting the um, initial node. We do put the initial node here because um, this is a forward analysis and the initial node here is this entry node. And now um, the main loop of the algorithm starts where we look at this work list and while it's not empty, we're going to remove one of the statements from the list. So in this case, we're going to remove the entry node because that's the only one that, that is on the list. And then update the um, entry set. In this case, there's nothing to do. And then compute the exit set based on the updated entry set of the entry node, which in this case just means that it stays um, the, the empty set. So this set is going to stay um, as it was before. And now because we have visited the statement for the first time, we are adding all the successors of the entry statement to our work list. In this case, there's exactly one successor, which is statement one. Next, um, the loop continues because the work list is not yet empty. We're going to remove the element um, that is there, element one, and are um, looking at statement one now, where we um, again take the incoming um, set, so the empty set that we get from the entry node and update the entry set of uh, statement one with it. So this um, stays here as the empty set. And then um, something changes because now we are updating the exit set of statement one by um, looking at the transfer function that we have written down for that uh, statement, 
which is going to add this expression a plus b to the set because this expression actually is becoming available after having executed that statement. So now again, um, we need to um, look at um, the successors of statement one because it was the first time that we had visited this statement. And this is why we're adding statement two now to our work list. Statement two is then removed from the work list. And when visiting statement two, we start by first propagating the exit state of uh, set uh, of node one here. So this becomes the new entry set of statement two. And then we need to update the exit set as well, where we keep the a plus b expression and now add another expression a times b, because that other expression is um, becoming an available expression after executing statement two. Next, because we um, have changed something and also because the statement two was visited for the first time, we are going to add all the successors of statement two to the work list. In this case, there's exactly one successor, namely statement three. So this is the one that is going to be picked next and we are um, visiting statement three now. In statement three, we are taking the um, two incoming sets, namely the exit set of statement two, this one, and the exit set of statement five, this one, and the meet operator for this analysis is intersection. So we're going to intersect these two sets, which means we will get an empty set. And this means that the entry set of statement three does not change. Now the entry set hasn't changed, but the exit set actually does change because this um, statement three is computing the expression a plus b. So we're going to have um, this as the exit set of statement three. Now again, we're looking at the successes of statement three. In this case, there's the exit node and um, the um, uh, statement four. The exit node is kind of special, so we do not have to visit it here. Um, so this is ignored, but we um, put statement four here. Um, since this is the only element on the list, we're going to remove it again right away and we'll then um, visit statement four which means we are propagating the exit set of statement three into the entry set of statement four. So we now have a plus b here. And then um, apply the transfer function of statement four, which means we are going to remove, well, we're going to first add the statement, um, the expression a minus one, but then because a is um, written into, we have to remove all expressions that include a, which in this case means we're going to remove both a plus b and a minus one. So only the empty set remains at the end. Now again, we're looking at the successes of statement four, which is statement five, um, which brings us into another iteration of the loop where we are now looking into statement five. In statement five, we start by propagating the entry set, which will just be the empty set again, and then update the exit set, which will contain a plus b because a plus b is actually computed by this statement five. Now statement five was visited for the first time and also has changed its exit set, which means we need to add the successes of statement five to our work list. And this means that we're going to add statement three. So note that we are now visiting statement three again, and we do this because something has changed. Um, so we now um, remove statement three from the work list in order to visit it, which means that we are going to look at all the um, incoming sets, which means we're looking at this set and we're looking at this set because both of those are flowing into statement three and then take the intersection of these two sets, which means that we are going to obtain um, set A plus B. Now, given this new entry set, um, we can now update the exit set of statement three, which means we take this updated entry set with a plus b and add the expression that becomes available um, because of the transfer function of statement three, which means we are adding a plus b again, um, but this just gives us the same exit set for statement three again. And that means um, because the exit set of statement three has not been changed, we do not need to add 
anything here into the work list simply because um, nothing has changed. So we do not have to go through statements four and five and so again and again. And this means because now the work list is empty, um, the algorithm has terminated and we have successfully computed um, all the um, um, yeah, available expressions by solving these data flow equations. One question that you may now have about this algorithm is whether it's guaranteed to always terminate. So in principle, workless algorithms may run forever simply because it may happen that the same um, states uh, or the same nodes actually are added again and again to the work list. And then we may just iterate over and over um, over these nodes. But of course, you do not want this to happen for a program analysis because you would like to terminate the analysis um, in, in some reasonable time. And in order to do this, um, there is a trick that we can play, which is to um, um, impose two kinds of constraints onto the definition of the data flow problem, which will essentially um, ensure termination of the work list algorithm. So the first constraint that we are uh, imposing here is that the domain of the analysis, so this set um, of things that the analysis can reason about, uh, needs to be a partial order with finite height. So essentially this means that um, there are no infinite ascending chains where um, according to this order, things are getting larger and larger and larger forever. And then the second uh, constraint is that the transfer functions and the meet operator need to be defined in such a way that um, the, um, the, the evolution of these sets is monotonic with respect to the partial order um, over the domain of the analysis, which essentially means that all the sets that we are looking at always either stay the same or grow larger, um, but, but, but they're never getting smaller again. And if you have these two uh, constraints in place, then this whole um, data flow analysis framework is called a monotone framework, simply because the, the sets are monotonically increasing. Um, for the analyses that we've seen so far, um, these two uh, constraints are actually always fulfilled. So all of the analyses that we've seen so far are guaranteed to terminate. For example, for the available expressions analysis, um, the domain of the analysis was the set of non-trivial expressions, and you can um, define a partial order with finite height on height on these um, on these sets and subsets of uh, um, available expressions by basically saying that you can add more expressions to the set, but at most you can add all the available expressions um, in the program. And then the transfer function and the meet operator ensure that um, this whole um, evolution of the sets is monotonic because you can only just add um, available expressions. And in the worst case, you can basically add all of the expressions, but at this point, the algorithm is guaranteed to terminate. All right, and that's already the end of this um, short video on how to solve the data flow equations that describe the solution of a data flow problem. So now that you've seen the work list algorithm, you should be able to actually apply this algorithm to a data flow problem and should be able to actually solve these equations um, by yourself. And you should also be able to do it efficiently because the work list algorithm um, um, does only visit nodes again if this is really necessary in order to compute the final fixed point. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.